from the Sixers scrimmage yesterday. Look ahead to tomorrow's scrimmage. We're here right here on 97.3 ESPN as the Sixers ramp up for their playoff run. Kevin McCormick joins us now on the boardwalk on the hotline. You can check out all of his work over at 97.3 ESPN.com as well as the 97.3 ESPN mobile app, and make sure you're following him on Twitter at KevinMCC973. Kev, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Josh. I'm excited like you. It's good to have an actual new game to talk about for the first time in months. Well, one of the things we do got to talk about is, and you put the tweet out there, and I saw a couple other people bring this up as well. So basically, it looks like that Ben Simmons can actually be a four spacer and be a stretch four in that game yesterday, I know it's only a scrimmage, but we got to think that there's elements to what we saw in that game yesterday that can be rolled back into real basketball play. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, the movement of him off ball will help with that a lot just because the play where he made his three yesterday was very similar to two threes we saw him make in the regular season. So now seeing him off the ball in positions where he can get in the spots where he feels comfortable and the ball is coming to him as opposed to him having to create that three-point shot on his own is going to be crucial to him, hopefully shooting more as the season continues. I feel like also he may actually be a better assist man playing off the ball at times because it allows him to not have to be the primary guy bringing the ball up the court. It allows him to maybe survey the scene from a different perspective. And I think that's maybe opening up more opportunities for him to get assists. Absolutely. I think one thing that's really going to help is with him moving to that front court, we now get to see him in position. We actually saw this a lot yesterday where he would catch a rebound or a steal right at the rim and instantly push the break. And now with him moving to the front court and adding another smaller wing player out there, you have an extra weapon out there to go spot up on the three to where either it's a front court buzzer or a Matisse five to where now Ben's able to just run coast to coast and have multiple options to either dish out for the three or even have those guys create the space to him just get right to the room. Also, how important is it the fact that, you know, I think we overlook the reality that, you know, when the Sixers hit the break because of the pandemic, everything getting shut down, these guys were suffering from a lot of issues. You know, Ben had the back. Joel had some nagging health issues. We know that Tobias wasn't 100% healthy either. So, you know, how much of this layoff may have also benefited the Sixers? Because when I saw Ben Simmons yesterday, he looked like a new man almost physically. Absolutely. There was a good amount of that game where Ben Simmons looked hands down like he was the best player on the court. And he showed it, too. He looked extremely confident just in the way he was playing and in his game. I mean, we saw him throw a no-look alley from the three-point line to Tobias Harris on the the comfort level of this team and the confidence that he showed yesterday was very big for me. Kevin McCormick joining us here on the Boardwalk kind of hotline on 97.3 ESPN, 76ers and NBA writer for 97.3 ESPN.com. You know, Kevin, another thing with Ben Simmons is that I know everyone wants to talk about the three-point shot, but the bigger thing to me was his willingness to play off the ball. And this is something that we talked about a little bit last week because when I had Brandon Robinson and Scoop B on to talk about it, you know, he brought this up, and I did a little bit digger deep. And, you know, there's a long history in the NBA of guys who were primary ball handlers who then played off the ball, and their them and their teams had a lot of success. So, is there a possibility that playing off the ball actually puts Ben Simmons in an opportunity to impact the team even more than previously? Absolutely, because I think you're putting him in more positions to show just how good of a scorer he can be as well. And I think he actually showed a great balance yesterday of being aggressive as a scorer, but also being able to impact the game with his playmaking as well. But I think definitely in this new role, in the sense of you'll be able to throw him in different kinds of spots and really allow him to elevate his game and show just how much he can do on the offensive side of the ball. Now, you mentioned offense. What about the defense? I know that some people were saying, well, it's just a scrimmage. But I felt like the Sixers really took it took an opportunity in front of them to show what they can do defensively, getting active hands. I mean, Matisse and Ben, the combination of those two guys, and even Jake Milton, those guys had a tremendous game on the perimeter against a team that, let's be realistic, if the Grizzlies can't impact you with their perimeter players, they have a lot of trouble beating teams. 
Yeah, I mean, we saw from the offseason that, you know, the, the mantra of this team became size and length. And, you know, Brett has said a million times throughout the year that this team was built for the playoffs and that the Sixers were going to become a defensive powerhouse this year. And I think they showed it in all areas yesterday. I mean, one thing that really stuck out to me was how active everyone's hands were in the passing lanes. And that's going to be big because perimeter play is, you know, how teams run their offense these days. It's not inside out, it's outside in. So, I mean, having all those guys out there being able to pick the passing lanes, whether it's Fyatt Harris or Matisse Thibel or Ben Simmons. I mean, even the backcourt players. I mean, Shake Milton is only 6'5", has a 7th wingspan, along with Josh Richardson is equally as tall in a 6'10 wingspan. I mean, the Sixers has the length, and the effort they showed on defense yesterday was very great. What did you think of how Brett Brown went to the bench? You know, the when and where he brought in Cork Maz, Thibel, Horford. What did you think of that strategy? Because I felt like, you know, Brett was kind of telling us a little bit about how he views his bench with the order he brought those guys in. I thought the rotations were good last night. I thought we got to see a good mix of different lineups together and, you know, different pairings on the court. We actually got to see a little bit of Al Horford and Joel Embiid, which was quite a surprise after Brett said they didn't spend any time together in practice. But all in all, I thought the rotations were very spread out. I thought it was good that we got to see everybody get out there and kind of shake the rust off. But I think the rotations will change a little bit as play develops. But all in all, I liked all the pairings and the rotations that Brett threw out yesterday. What did you think of the play of Thibel? I thought Thibel made a very good case to have a larger role in those eight games between how he played defensively, but also his willingness to be a part of the offense as well. Absolutely. I mean, I thought he had a very good game, although he only made one three. He shot four, which is good because, I mean, obviously that first came back, everything is not going to fall. But the fact that he's showing that willingness to really lock in and be that catch-and-shoot guy on offense is going to be big. And we saw that huge poster dunk on Darren Jackson Jr., which was awesome just from a confidence standpoint. It's just good to see him being aggressive and still, you know, trying to grow his game on that end because he understands that that's going to make him an even more valuable piece moving forward. What do you think about how Brett is going to use Cork Mize and Thibel in terms of, is there a possibility because of certain teams, they may play those guys together and not one or the other? Um, I think we'll see them together in stints. I mean, one lineup that Brett has talked about during his media availability, and then we actually got to see it yesterday, was Ben Simmons at point guard, Thibault and Kourmans together along with Tobias Harris and Al Horford together in the front court. And I thought that that lineup actually played rather well in their time together on the court. But if the T Thibault is knocking down his shot, I think they could be a great pairing together. I mean, you'll have another great perimeter defender to go with Ben Simmons and Matisse Bible, and you'll have all the weapons and shooting and spacing with the two of them out there together with Ben Simmons to kind of orchestrate the offense. Now, you mentioned now Horford. What did you think about how he looked yesterday? Because he, he made some jumpers. He had some impact on the offensive side of the ball. You know, I thought he looked good. He said before that you know, he was kind of really getting into his groove uh, right before the season was suspended. So, I mean, he looked like his legs were under him. He looked like he was moving well. And hopefully he continues to build on it. Kevin McCormick here with me on the Boardwalk on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. Make sure you're following him on Twitter. Kevin MCC973 covers the Sixers for 97.3 ESPN.com. Kevin, who else from the bench stood out to you yesterday? Because I felt like Brett at one point just decided to empty the entire bench. And I know, yeah, you know, Norval Pell made some highlights because of his three, but legitimately of the guys who are going to make an impact when the Sixers get back to official play, who off the bench stood out to you? One guy for me that stood out was Gordon Robinson the third. I feel like he, he got a good amount of minutes yesterday, which we could see a lot moving forward. But just the energy he brought, I mean, he's even said a lot that he's really just focused in on playing his role and doing what he can do to the best of his ability. And I thought he did that well yesterday. He came in, brought great energy, was playing both sides of the floor, running hard was moving around off the ball well, spotting up, was able to knock down the three, had a nice dunk on the break. But this play was great because he's another one who's in that batch of 
wing players off the bench to where if they get hot, you know, they're a real weapon for the Sixers. Now, flip it forward to tomorrow's scrimmage. Of course, people can hear it right here on 97.3 ESPN, 12 o'clock. Tom McGinn is calling all the action. What are some of the things that you are looking forward into this scrimmage from the second time round for the Sixers unit? Hopefully, in game two, one thing I'm looking for, I want to see a little bit more of Joel Embiid. He only played 12 minutes yesterday, which I fully understand. It's, you know, it's the first scrimmage game. He hasn't been back in months. You really want to ease your way in with a guy like him. But I thought he looked phenomenal. For having four months off, his jumper was looking great. In 12 minutes, he got 10 points, handful of boards, knocked down a pair of threes. I mean, hopefully in this next game, we get to see a little more of Joel Embiid, maybe a little more in the post, just to see what he's been working on and to see, you know, just how much better he is time in the time away. Now, speaking of Embiid, you know, we didn't, you mentioned, we didn't see a ton of him yesterday, but what is a reasonable expectation for him when these eight games hit? Because I know Brett previously talked about him playing 38 minutes, and Brett, I mean, Embiid's only done that, I think, four times in his entire postseason career, playing at least 38 minutes. So, I don't know if I'm sitting here and being like, yeah, give me MB for 38 minutes. So what's a reasonable expectation for Joel when the Sixers get back to full-blown action next weekend? In those seeding games, I mean, I feel like right around that 30-minute mark would be a good, you know, kind of setting point for him in these eight seeding games just because you don't want to go fully rant it with him. They want, obviously, you still want to continue to ease him in and you want him to be fresh for the playoffs. Yeah, you still want to get him enough time out there to break that sweat, you know, you know, back in the groove of inaction. So hopefully they don't continue to keep a light load on him, but obviously you don't want to go all out with him because you don't want to burn out and come play out time. Now you mentioned him getting burned out. Now, I'm just gonna play devil's advocate here. You know, isn't he supposed to be in this great shape and great condition? He's been working out six days a week and he's in the best shape of his life, blah, 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 blah. So how much of it is him getting burned out, and how much of it is, is his conditioning up to the level that the Sixers want him to be to play the maximum number of minutes? I feel like his conditioning's there. I mean, even though we saw him a little bit yesterday, I thought he moved well on the court yesterday, and there's been previous videos that they released of scrimmages in recently in Orlando, you know, obviously them just playing themselves. But, I mean, he looks like he's moving well. He looks like he's thinned out a little bit, which is a good sign, but it's more of just you want to ease him back, you know, especially you know a guy at his size and with his injury history. Yeah, even though they've come out and said that he's in the best shape of his life and he's been working hard, you don't want to try too hard to you know kind of prove it to everybody. You rather just wait, you know, make sure he's ready so that come playoffs he can then step up and show that you know just to back up all the talk. Now you mentioned talking about back up the talk. I think if the Sixers are healthy, they have a chance to make a deep playoff run when these games return after the eight games because number one you're going to be playing a Pacers and a Wizards team that let's be realistic they don't really have a full power team in those eight games so you have an opportunity to move up in the standings if you want to you have an opportunity to get yourself 100% ready for a postseason run where I think the Sixers can match up with the best teams in the Eastern Conference what do you think Kev? Absolutely. In my eyes, I think it's honestly a three-team race in the East right now between Philadelphia and Milwaukee and Toronto. In my eyes, those are the three teams that have a serious chance to represent the Eastern Conference in these finals. But in terms of depth and talent, you can't say that the Sixers roster isn't the best or up there with the best in the conference or the league right now. I mean, you have guys like Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, and they also have one of the deepest benches that we've seen in years. So in terms of talent and what they have at the ready right now, the Sixers look poised to make a deep run. If you could zero in on a team that you think would give the Sixers trouble in a postseason series in the Easter Conference, that's not the Milwaukee Bucks. Give me another team that you th- you are looking at. You're just saying, listen, if this team brings this thing to the table, that could be a problem for the Sixers in the playoffs. I would have to say it's Toronto. Obviously, they lost Kawhi Leonard, who was the anchor of that series last year, but they're still an extremely deep roster. They're still an extremely talented roster. They have arguably the best coach in the NBA right now, Nick Nurse. So in terms of a team, I would 
try to avoid a team that severely gives the Sixers fits, it would be Toronto just because in the regular season, they just play them really well. Nick Nurse has shown that he knows how to play on the Sixers' weaknesses. You know, the Sixers were able to upset them once this year in terms of how they would match up in a playoff series. I think it could arguably go either way. What concerns you more about the Raptors? Is it the guard play or is it the fact that Marcus All is already showing the ability to give Embiid trouble? I think it's a combination of a lot of that. They have a guy like Marcus All who can defend Joel Embiid. Pascal Siakam is a larger front court player that is able to slow down Ben Simmons. And I mean, they're dead, but arguably their deep, their secret weapon is their coach. I mean, Having a great guy like Nick Nurse orchestrating that entire team is arguably what scares me the most about Toronto. Yeah, I think Nick Nurse should be the coach of the year, but that's just my opinion. I don't get a vote in that thing. <laughs> He's Kevin McCormick here joining us on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Kevin MCC973. Of course, make sure you check out all of his work at 973ESPN.com as him and Jason Blevins are covering wall-to-wall Sixers coverage as the Sixers have two more scrimmages and that's officially back to games that count. And you hear all the action right here on 97.3 ESPN. Kevin, I appreciate you jumping on the show today and I'm sure we'll be touching base soon. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. No problem.